All right, so now that the Pentagon has given a green light to ending Don't Ask, Don't Tell, what will Congress do and when will they do it? NBC's Jim Miklaszewski is live at the Pentagon. He joins us now. So, Jim, the survey is complete. Gates and Mullen, they've made it clear that they support this repeal. So explain to us what happens next in this process. Well, advocates of the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, both in the Obama administration and right here at the Pentagon, had hoped that the results of this 10-month review that was ordered by Secretary of Defense Robert Gates uh, would have enough positive information in that they could, uh, they could actually give some of the wavering Democrats up on Capitol Hill some political cover to vote for the repeal and perhaps convince a couple of re uh, re uh, Republicans uh, to come over to the Democrat side uh, to vote for this. The, the key over the next couple of days will be hearings before the Senate Armed Services Committee when, when Secretary of Defense Gates and, and Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, General, uh, I mean, Admiral Mullen, will testify tomorrow. Uh, but again, all the fireworks could come on Friday when all four service chiefs, the Navy, Air Force, uh, Marines, and uh, Army will testify on Don't Ask, Don't Tell. And remember, the Marine Corps Commandant had, has already told Congress he's against the repeal, and there's some suspicion among those in the Army that the Army Chief of Staff has his doubts about repeal. So I think that will truly be the key. If all four of the service chiefs finally say, yes, okay, it appears to be the will of the American people, even some of the services, to repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell, that could convince Congress, perhaps, uh, to vote for the repeal. The problem here, mm -hmm. of course, is that Republicans say they've got a lot on their plate in this lame duck session, and they may not get to it. All right, so Vic, let's go with the premise of uh, if, as opposed to when the repeal happens. So if it happens, what kind of challenges is the Pentagon anticipating with this, especially with regard to the troops, combat troops that are currently serving in Iraq and also Afghanistan. You know, that's one of the reasons that SecDef Gates had ordered this 10-month review, not, not to determine if it should be repealed, but how would you implement that repeal? And, and they did come up with some ideas about, you know, uh, leadership. It, it's a leadership issue. There has to be mm -hmm. extensive training for the forces. Uh, and, and unlike, for example, the segregation of the forces under Harry S. Truman, there was no plan. It took six to seven years for that to be implemented. Gates doesn't want to see that happen here. And he did make one point yesterday that he doesn't want to see the repeal take effect until the Pentagon, until the military certifies that it's time. And earlier he predicted that that could take as long as a year. Jim Miklaszewski. Mick, thank you so much. Okay. Uh, we move on now, and according to that same Pentagon report, 48% of those surveyed in the Army oppose serving with gays, and in the Marine Corps it's higher, with 58% opposing. Retired U.S. Marine Sergeant Brian Fricke is an Iraq War veteran and a member of the Board of Directors for the Service Members Legal Defense Network, and Tony Perkins is the president of the Family Research Council and a veteran of the U.S. Marine Corps. Uh, gentlemen, I want to thank both of you for coming on today. Brian, I want to start with you. You served in Iraq, you returned home, and then you left the service, I believe, in 2005. Explain to all of us why you did that. Uh, well, thank you for having me on, first of all. Um, my flight back to, uh, to the States was a, a very exciting moment. My, my, my unit came in. We were excited to be back home uh, on the tarmac. I looked out. I did see uh, all the Welcome Home banners, the American flags, uh, Welcome Home Marines. And my partner couldn't be there on the tarmac with me. And that was really the, the, the primary moment uh, of isolation. I felt different than the rest of my, my, my Marines. Uh, those who uh, I had beneath me and those above me, uh, I didn't feel a part of the unit at that point. I really felt different. And, and that was when I chose uh, to not re-enlist. I decided this was not uh, the way that we should be treated. We should all be treated the same, welcomed home the same. I did the exact same job that my uh, fellow Marines had done, and uh, that's when I chose not to re-enlist. Were you honest and open with your brothers in arms? Did they know you were gay? Uh, there was a select few. Yes, I did not come out to my uh, upper chain of command. I knew the rules. Uh, there's actually a book out called Playing by the Rules, and that's exactly what it's about. We have to uh, this extra burden to hide who we are. We cannot fully integrate with the unit. Uh, it's not about us coming out and being able to just be open. Uh, it's about not being afraid to lose our jobs, to lose our careers. Uh, I knew I would not have that uh, peace of mind. I couldn't just dedicate myself to the job and not have to worry about it. Uh, it was a, a looming uh, fear, actually, uh, more so than any, anybody else had to deal with. Uh, Tony, you are also a veteran of the Marine Corps. And I want to go ahead and show you what Senator John McCain had to say about this issue uh, back in 2006. Take a listen. 
the day that this, the, the leadership of the military comes to me and says, Senator, we ought to change the policy, then I think we ought to consider seriously changing it because those leaders in the military are the ones we give the responsibility to. So, uh, Tony, explain to all of us why we shouldn't listen uh, to Secretary Gates or Admiral Mullen, both of whom got their jobs under President Bush, when they say that ending this policy will not hurt the military. Well, both of those are political leadership of the military. When you look at the operational chiefs, the, the, the chairman, uh, Mullen is the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, but when you look at the branch, uh, the operational branch leaders, uh, who we just which mentioned earlier uh, in the previous segment, that they're, they all have expressed opposition to overturning uh, this policy. And so I think that's what uh, Senator McCain, who I've talked to a number of times about this, was talking about the operational leadership of the military who has direct control over those troops. And, and let me just say this. I want to thank Brian for his service in, in the Marine Corps as a, as a fellow Marine. Uh, but this is not about individuals. I think he would acknowledge that, that when we talk about national security, it's about our military and what is best for the military. And here we are in a lame duck session of Congress, and we're taking a policy that is going to change uh, a longstanding uh, policy in our military and overturn it and the implications of this are very serious and the implications for national security uh, are very serious. It's and about modernization of the force though. This is exactly what it's about and that's what these commandants should be uh, taking into consideration. They have to balance the uh, status quo and, and the, the long-standing heritage and history, the illustrious history of our Corps uh, along with modernization. So th it's a it's an extra burden and they should not be speaking out uh, out of line with the, the president, the commander-in-chief uh, they should be fully focused on implementation. They should be leaders in this. And I know that the Marine Corps is, uh, it, we are professional war fighters. It's about the orders we receive and about how well we uh, execute those orders. The troops you know, are ready for repeal. Brian, that's a, that's, a, that's a good point. If we were not an all-volunteer all force, when you look at the question that was missing in this survey was, should this policy be overturned? And so we did our own scientific poll of over 10,000 members of our military. And uh, as has been pointed out, among the Marines, it's been much higher in opposition. In fact, 68% of Marines said they were opposed to overturning this policy. And as many as 30% of the spouses in all branches of the service said they would recommend to their husbands not to re-enlist. How can we possibly sustain our position as a national uh, world leader in terms of security if we're having 30% of our force leave but because don't, don't you of think this that people wouldn't want to re-enlist because we're currently in two wars and we don't have a good policy in place that's letting people come home from these wars and have enough time with their families? I think spouses are saying, oh. don't re-enlist because we're in two wars right now and I never see you. Well, no, that actually, that's a good point. I think our, our military is extremely stressed right now after 10 years of a war in Afghanistan. But this this 30 cent percent res, was in response to the military you survey serve? about the impact Tony, that this when, policy would when have. When you were in the Marine Corps, you don't think you served with gays? No, oh, I have no question that, they, that, they, that we probably, I probably did. I did not And how know. are they a threat to national security? Well, it's not an issue of, of whether or not gays, the, the, the current policy of don't but ask, But you said no earlier allows. it's an issue of national security. So how is it an issue of national well, security? Well, it, it is an issue of national security if you have 30% of your force that's going to leave. And, the, and, the, and uh, Secretary Gates has said you can vote with your feet. I'm sorry, it was uh, Admiral Mullen said you can vote with your feet if you don't like the overturning of this policy. And if 30% of the force leaves, that obviously is a national security issue. Uh, but They're do you think leave. that the, the retention... same argument was when we had desegregation, and that was the same arguments they were to saying totally that, different that they would issue. walk away. Totally different issue. Uh -huh. You're right. Brian, same, same, just, same red herring. Same Brian, red herring, from, from different your, issue. From your point of view, though, why do you think, uh, you know, as Tony said, and as we've said, 58% of Marines oppose serving with gays. This is higher than any other branch of the military, uh, even if only by this certain percentage. Why do you think that the Marines are coming in with this 58% this saying, you know what, I don't really like this? I think you have two reasons. You've got the data, right? You have more Marines. Uh, there's a strong correlation between the, the percentage of Marines who support gays and actually have knowingly served with gays, and those who don't know that they've served with gay Marines. Uh, there's more support when they actually know and they have misconceptions torn down about what it means to be gay. That you're not less competent, that you're not less gung ho, less a Marine, that you're a predator, that you're uh, predatory in nature. Um, and there's also leadership. You have the past commandants out, out publicly saying that they are. Uh, are opposed to the repeal, the and of course commandant. that's going to influence.
You have the current and, commandant and, saying, and, and it's not it's not an issue of whether or not they want to serve with gays. That's not what the opposition is. The opposition is to open homosexuality in the military. That's why uh, the open current heterosexuality policy, in the military the, the, has no place. Yeah, but, Oh, well, you're absolutely right. It's not about under your, current law. I should not have under to current law, that's a good point, Brian. Under current law, you can be uh, discharged for committing adultery because there are boundaries in sexual activity and do you think that in the military. Do you think there are witch hunts? Do you think there are witch hunts for that? To that effect. Uh, I served. I, no, no, you're right. I, I served with those who were uh, brought up on charges for committing adultery, and also uh, th there are certain boundaries in who you can have relationships with in the military. And the concern again, by many military the issue leaders, specifically, well, though, listen, Brian. Let me let me finish my statement. The concern about mil many military leaders is that if this policy is overturned, that those same prohibitions against certain sexual conducts will be removed, which break down, uh, which, which will break down the the morale and this the discipline. This is not changing the military is based on military justice at all. It does not change no, no, the UCMJ. No, that, hey guys, that, no. the, the military is based on uh, a principle of discipline. I think you both can uh, agree with that and they follow the rules uh, as they should and this is something that they're going to continue to evaluate and I know that uh, certain other countries like Australia, Ireland, uh, excuse me, Israel, Great Britain and Canada, uh, they've shown that open service have no adverse effect on enrollment or even retention. Uh, but we're going to have to leave it there. Tony Perkins and Brian Fricky, I want to thank both of you for coming on and we'll invite you guys back when we have more time to continue talking about this topic. So thank you. Thank you, sir. All right.